Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Office Hour session. Uh, my name is Purva Ashok. Um, I'm the project lead at the Rebus Community, and I'm joined today by Karen Lortzen and Barb Thies from the Open Education Network. Rebus is a charity that is based in Canada. Um, we offer programs and resources to support all kinds of open publishing efforts. Um, and today we'll be talking about the power of social media storytelling, um, hashtag OER. Uh, if this is your first time attending office hours, just know that this is a very informal conversation. The format really is to hear from um, our four fantastic guests today for about five minutes each, um, after which we'll turn the conversation over to you. Um, you can share your questions, your experiences, or your thoughts in general. If there are other topics that you'd like us to explore as part of our Office Hours series, or if there's someone that you would like um, to see on this um, stage here as a guest, um, you can always drop in your suggestions. And Barbara Cadden will share a document here um, where you can submit your suggestions. So today we have a great lineup of guests who will talk about the unique challenges involved in creating stories that resonate with people and um, that resonate with people across different challenges. So what I'll do now is hand it over to Karen to not only introduce our guests, but also share a little bit about the Open Education Network. Karen, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Aperva, and welcome, everyone. I am with the Open Education Network, as are many people in this call. We are a community of professionals who are supporting one another in creating resources and strategies for promoting open education and higher education. I'm joined by my colleague, Barb Thies, our community manager. And we are delighted to partner with the Rebus community on office hours. And as Aperva said, we are going to be talking about social media storytelling today and what a well-planned marketing campaign can do for your OER initiatives. So our four guests are Lee Kinch Pedrosa, Head of Marketing and Communications with Pressbooks, Sarah Meese, Digital Publishing Assistant at Virginia Tech University Libraries, Carolina Karras, Strategist, Marketing and Communications at BC Campus, and Symphony Swift, who is a Communications Specialist at OpenStax. So without further ado, we'll turn things over to them. And uh, as they're talking, please feel free to drop your questions into the chat. And once we've heard from everyone, we will turn uh, to those questions and start our conversation together. Also, um, as a reminder, anyone who's here is very welcome to share their stories and experience also in creating and sharing social media campaigns. There's a lot of knowledge and experience among our group, so everyone is welcome to share. So with all of that said, I'm going to turn things over to you, Sarah. All right. Hi, so I'm Sarah Meese. I'm a digital publishing assistant at Virginia Tech, um, and I am also a graduate student at the University of Southern California and I'm studying digital social media. So in my program, I'm studying analytics, public relations, content creation, basically who is interacting with what social media content and why. So I'm learning a lot about how we can utilize social media to promote our textbooks. Um, this is especially important right now because of the pandemic and it's extremely cost-effective way to get information and marketing materials about all of our books out there. Um, so I want to talk about how we use social media to market our textbook introduction to biosystems engineering and our overall marketing plan for that. So just a little bit, bit about intro to biosystems. Um, it was published earlier this year with um, published jointly with ASABE, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. Um, so this book had a lot of authors. It was written by an international team. It was a really interesting project. Um, so when developing the marketing strategy for this book, our first step, we just created simple basic marketing plan and filled out as much as I could, uh, you know, using our perspective dates, putting in question marks for things we needed to discuss or figure out. So I have a sample plan like this. I'll just put it in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in developing something similar, that's a good resource. Um, I started planning marketing for this book probably like six to eight months out before the release. Um, I think it's important to start planning this out and realizing your goals for this as soon as possible and as early on in the process so that if you want to pull in other people, uh, you have the time to do that. So we just planned out for this book, we planned out who we were targeting. So, you know, like professors, students for textbooks. Um, and then I wrote out a positioning statement, which I think is really helpful because 
as you work like so extensively on these projects, you know every little detail and it helps to just think about the basic information, what you need to convey, um, where it's available, just the kind of stuff people need to know if they don't know anything about the project. So then I just created the timeline, dates, who is doing what, um, where things are gonna be shared, like email, blogs, Twitter. Um, so then we also contacted our library's communication director really early on to write our press release. Um, but you can also write these yourselves. So something we've talked about, like in my graduate program, um, press releases, I know they seem kind of tedious or maybe outdated compared to like social media, um, but they're important because they kind of give you something really polished, you can just widely distribute and it kind of is more attention catching if you get a press release in your inbox rather than just like a more casual email notification. Um, so part of our plan was also utilizing listservs, which you can send out the press release, just the link to the text, the image of the textbook, and you can send it out to like your OER list, your subject list, your internal list. Um, like for ours, we do like the library and um, potentially like you can connect that to professors who are teaching in the subject and see what listservs they have. Um, so this is a good way to just get everything out to people who are already interested in hearing about the book. Um, so then in terms of social me media, we mainly use Twitter. Uh, this is just a great way, short amounts of information out there and uh, to just start promoting our textbooks to compose a tweet. I just do start with something basic, the name of the book, the link, uh, something short about it. Tweets with images usually get more attention and engagement. So if you can, it's good to include one. Um, the cover of the book is usually just a good image to use. And we automate and schedule tweets through TweetDeck. Uh, there are a couple different services you can use for this, but TweetDeck is really easy to use. It's free. It's available to anyone who already has a Twitter account. So if you have it, you already have access to TweetDeck. And um, some things to remember when composing your tweets, you can tag, you can add authors like handles, you can tag organizations you're working with so they can amplify it. You can utilize these hashtags related to your content or OER work so that your book could be found by people searching through the hashtags. Um, a lot of people use Twitter professionally, so you can get more engagement than you think if you're uh, tagging what you're doing. Um, they can also be amplified by your department or institution this way, and you can gain more exposure through that. Um, so finally, when using social media or Twitter, it's important to remember you can tweet out the same topics or links more than once. So come up with a schedule to tweet about your work in the upcoming months so that your pro promotion doesn't die out. Um, each time you tweet, you can use a different blurb or focus on a different aspect of the text. So for biosystems, um, like I announced it's released and then we tweeted out about how it was created by different authors. And then we have upcoming tweets planned about kind of the unique way the book was created. So we keep talking about it throughout the upcoming months. Um, Twitter is our main social media we use. And whenever we want something posted to like Facebook or Instagram, we just do this through uh, the Virginia Tech Libraries page. And our, we have a really easy system where we just fill out a request and they post it to their channels. Um, this kind of helps the library have more of a cohesive social media presence um, and helps our content to just go out to a, a wide group of people, everyone following along with the library instead of just um, Virginia Tech publishing. And then also when we're posting our own content on Twitter, we can still have the library share it. So that's just more widely shared. Um, and that's kind of all I have on our, our planning for that. So uh, looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, over to you, Lee. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I'm Lee Kinch Pedrosa. Uh, I used to be the marketing and comms manager at the Rebus Foundation, but now I'm the head of marketing and comms at Pressbooks. So I just sort of moved over slightly. Um, but before that, I was actually the general manager of a Canadian national storytelling organization um, where I produce storytelling events and personal storytelling events. And I taught scholars and entrepreneurs how to use personal storytelling in their work. So I was really excited to be invited to talk about uh, social media storytelling. Um, but my background in storytelling actually coupled with my background in marketing makes me kind of skeptical when people use the term storytelling in social media context because it's so often just used as a buzzword by like marketing influencers who are trying to sell you uh, content services. I do, however, believe that there are elements of storytelling, particularly like knowing the hook of your book or 
seeing yourself and your peers as characters that can be deployed in social media in really effective ways. Um, for open, uh, there are additional difficulties, specifically that like Twitter is the preferred space for the open movement and it doesn't support storytelling in the same way that some uh, platforms like Instagram or, or TikTok do. Um, Twitter is hard because uh, pieces of content like the tweets, they're so ephemeral and so easily like lost out into the ether. Um, and that's why driving, um, driving engagement around the tweet and your, it is so vital to successful Twitter campaigns. So um, that all said, like I think that starting by thinking about your book story is a really great way to start your book's marketing campaign. Um, what you're trying to do with story is to find the hook or what makes your book special. Um, when I'm brainstorming about a story, I start with the basic elements of story. Um, and sometimes it's easy as we like mature and move forward in our professional lives to forget the basics. But if you think back to, you know, your elementary um, English classes, you talked about character, you talk about setting, you talk about plot. Um, and by thinking about these more like tangible elements of stories rather than like the big things like theme, you can give your audience something to hold on to and to, to remember. Um, so if I were coaching you on how to tell the story of your book, I would first ask you, is the author of the book an interesting character? Or can you build a world around the setting of the book? And that setting could be a physical space or a time frame. Um, did something happen in the plot of your book's creation that is exciting? Did you overcome a significant obstacle? Um, I like to use the example of, uh, actually there's a book out of University of Washington Tacoma called the Black Lives Matter Storytelling Collective Project. Um, that book is a collaboration with students and it was created during the COVID-19 pandemic, so pretty recently, <laughs> during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a way of creating connection in the classroom in like an extreme circumstance, which would be you know, lockdown in 2020 around the time of the George Floyd protests. So that would be your setting, your historical setting. Um, and that to me is like a really great story that offers, um, I'll share the link in a second, <laughs> the, uh, that offers um, a lot for an audience to engage with and to remember. The setting is this virtual classroom during a global crisis. The characters are these two groups of students who are telling their stories in really unique ways. Um, the plot is one of open pedagogy and collaboration. Um, I, I really like this book, and if the author wanted to, they could create a super cool marketing campaign out of their book, um, for their book. I, th I think that everyone has a story to tell and that every book has a story. It just takes some reflection and some analysis to find it. So once you have the story, how do you move that to Twitter becomes the next challenge. Um, there are a lot of limitations with Twitter, that being 280 characters, you can get around that with tweet threads, but there's a complexities with the way that tweet threads are presented. Um, maybe you don't have an actor Twitter following, so like you could tell this really great story and like nobody will see it. So there are different, there have to be ways to, to drive engagement to those tweets, even if you don't have an active following already. Um, so you can write short, tw short tweets uh, using elements of the story, and then you can drive engagement to those tweets. So for example, with the BLM storytelling book, you could write individual tweets about a selection of the book's student authors, or like using quotes from them about their experiences. Or you could write a tweet thread about the creation of a book, telling the story from the perspective of the editor. Um, once you have those tweets, uh, like Sarah, I use TweetDeck too. It's free and like way better than the other paid services I find. So TweetDeck is great. Um, but like simply tweeting is not enough. You have to drive the engagement. Um, so some ways to do that would be to include images. Tweets with images perform better than tweets without images. Um, you have a book cover, you can use it and you can stick it right there. Well, usually you have a book cover. Um, it's a good place to start, but you can also use a tool like Canva, um, which is either they have a premium service, but I've just only ever used the free service to create really easy images um, with no graphic design experience. I know that Acorva has been using it for the uh, for the office hours uh, images, so it's it's pretty pretty useful. Um, and then you can bring in gifs and emojis to make them stand out. I think there's nothing wrong with gifs and emojis, and I think they're fun even in a professional place um, atmosphere. You can. I also recommend uh, tagging people, like Sarah said. Um, and especially people with a bigger following than you do. And I would just add too, like there's no harm in direct messaging someone and saying, hey, can you retweet my book? Because that little extra comment um, might drive it, whereas just tagging might not be enough. 
You can share your tweet in spaces outside of Twitter. Creative Commons does this really well. You'll see it in the listservs often if you follow them where they'll share a blog post or an event with a link to a pre-formatted tweet. And then you just share out that tweet. So it's like super easy and quick to get it, to get people to share for you um, and to amplify your message. Uh, another thing you can do is to ask a question in your tweet and then tweet people, tag people you wanna respond to that. Um, and then that way you get some sort of like organic conversation around it. And then finally, you yourself have to continually respond in that conversation um, because just the more, the more it does, the better it works in the algorithm to bring your tweets to the top. And I, as soon as you start talking with algorithms, I'm lost a little bit, but up more is the general, is the general thing. And then finally, if you wanna see how your tweet is doing, the Twitter analytics are actually very clear um, and you can access them pretty easily. And I find the engagement metric is the easiest one to talk about. That's about all I have to say. I have more to say, but I won't say anymore because it's too much. So, thanks. Great, thank you, Lee. And Carolina. Thank you. So I'm Carolina Karras. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm the marketing and communication strategist for BC campus, and I'm coming to you today from Victoria, British Columbia on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. So uh, just to do a quick summary of what BC campus does, because we do a lot, um, our primary focus is to support the post-secondary institutions here in BC as they adopt, adapt, and evolve their teaching and learning practices to just create a better experience for post-secondary students. So we do this through a few different avenues. Um, the first one being open education, which is obviously the lens that we're looking at a lot of our conversation today. But we also work in educational technologies, learning and teaching, indigenization, and uh, other special projects. Projects, and often they overlap. Uh, so today when we're talking about social media, um, I specifically wanted to talk about growing communities um, as a way to build um, your online community. Uh, so growing communities and building your online community as a way to have uh, those followers become advocates and storytellers for you. So I wanted to share a brief story about how my team and I have done um, have built our community over the past year during this pandemic and how we use this community to build um, storytellers both on and off social media. Uh, so at the start of the pandemic, uh, we took a look at our social media and I immediately noticed, you know, we had a small but mighty group of engaged followers, but you know, I like a good challenge. I wanted to grow this community and I wanted to see some fresh faces. And I definitely see some challenges in doing this. Um, I think the biggest one for me was that a lot of folks, they don't want to think about work, no matter how much they love their job or no matter how much they may be passionate about you know, open education, they just don't wanna see it in their personal timeline. Um, and so how the question became, how do we get them? How do we engage with them? How do we meet them where they want to be? And I, I'll admit at first I wanted to force this. I wanted to meet them on Twitter, meet them on Facebook, like make this happen, but that just wasn't organic. And so instead in, you know, the pandemic world that we've been living in, the place that these folks who were targeting were most comfortable was in fact on Zoom. So I couldn't do this alone. Um, I can't take credit for everything that was successful over the past year. Um, I work with really great colleagues and over the past year, BC campus has offered Zoom webinars just like this one, where we can share our experiences and um, share our expertise. So um, thanks to this new normal, it was a really easy way to introduce people who may not know BC campus in a space that wasn't social media. And by having my colleagues share their expertise on all things open, ed tech, whatever it might be, my colleagues were able to build trust, share the BC campus brand, and have genuine human interactions in an online medium through these weekly webinars. But we're talking about social media today. So how do we get from the webinar to having growth on social? Well, um, it wasn't easy. The next step was really seeing growth in our newsletter subscribers. So people who were attending our webinars, they wanted to start seeing us outside of the Zoom call. And they want to start seeing us in their inboxes a bit more frequently. And then we started seeing those names that were, you know, were on our webinar list or on our mailing list. Uh, we started seeing those names. Um, oh, thanks, Leah. Um, we started seeing those names trickling into our social media. And we started seeing them become more engaged with our daily content. So it became something where we started seeing folks on a 
semi-regular basis in our webinars to seeing them weekly in our newsletters to seeing them almost daily in our social. And this growth was also reflected in our Google Analytics stats as month over month, we kind of saw more acquisition coming in through our social channels. So after a few like hurdles that we jumped over, um, we eventually started seeing growth in our social and we started seeing these folks being the storytellers for us by resharing our content and engaging with us in the content that we were pushing out. So if there's one thing I could stress today, um, it's really not enough just to be on social media. There's a lot of noise, it's very competitive, um, and it's become increasingly challenging to cut through that noise. So instead, um, I would encourage you to think about who your organization is or what your product is and what value you bring to the table. If you're able to show that in a way to, that speaks to your target audience, they'll with, engage with you on any number of mediums, and that includes social media, but it's only once they see that value. And it might seem almost counterintuitive to think about growing your community outside of social media in order to see growth within those channels, but I think in doing this, you'll have more loyal followers who become your advocates or, in, or become your storytellers for you online. And uh, finally, like every path is different to getting to this point that we reached. Um, I think this is something that uniquely worked for us in the insanity that was this past year. But, um, you know, you, you already you have to start thinking about how to grow communities um, in any environment. So once we're away from the screens and hopefully spending more time together soon, we'll obviously have a very different strategy. So it's all about constantly pivoting to the time and place that you're in. Um, and so that's really all I prepared. Um, and I don't want to, you know, miss the opportunity to share our social media channels. I know that we have a few already in the chat, but I'll pop all those links in the chat in just a moment. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have after. Great. Thank you, Carolina. And over to you, Symphony. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Symphony, and I am the communication specialist with OpenStax. Um, a lot of really great things have already been shared, so I will probably echo some of what's been said already. Um, but a little bit about my role and about OpenStax just to get us started. So um, I, as a communication specialist, am very focused on brand advocacy. And under that umbrella falls a few things. It falls our social media. It falls some um, other marketing things like email. Um, uh, events like webinars and in the past when we used to go to conferences in person, those as well. Um, and then our PR. So I'm happy to answer any questions about how it all interconnects for us at OpenStax um, a little bit later on. But OpenStax is, as many of you probably already know, a um, free openly licensed textbook publisher. So all of our textbooks are OER and we have a pretty big community of over 36,000 uh, faculty adopters. Um, not all of them are with us on social media though. And so I think what Lee said about um, Twitter being like the space for a lot of the open education community is, is definitely true and something that we see a lot. We're on Twitter, uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram and we're on LinkedIn. We're also on YouTube, which is a whole other space kind of, um, <laughs> but we're most active on Twitter. Like when we have, you know, if we have a, a quota for a certain campaign of how many, you know, posts need to go out across social media platforms, the first thing we always think about is Twitter, just because that's where the community is most active. Um, so I actually want to talk a little bit about trial and error. Um, I think a really big part of figuring out what's going to work for you on social media is just testing stuff out. Um, and so what we do is we have these kind of phases throughout the year um, where we're, we're just testing different styles of posts. We're testing, you know, different types of content to share. Um, and just seeing what works. So like Lee said, if you're using Twitter, like go check your analytics because it's really helpful to know what people are really engaging with and what you can keep sharing in that moment because things will change periodically. Like, you know, one type of post with a certain type of content can be really popular and like really resonate with your audience um, over the course of two months. And then the next three months, it just doesn't, register with people. Um, so constantly checking and trying new things um, is really important. So 
a really big way that we did that and something we discovered um, over the past six months is we had a really large campaign called Free the Textbook. Um, and that's a really common saying <laughs> in the open community. Um, and that campaign specifically was about looking at um, inclusive access and really uh, encouraging students and faculty and administrators and, and people across the education space to look really closely at what's part of the inclusive access, access contracts that are running across campuses right now. And to see, you know, do these really work for students? Do these benefit faculty? How does this work if you are advocating for OER and you have an inclusive access program on your campus kind of thing? Um, and I'd say a major takeaway that we found from that, um, from running that campaign and just seeing what kind of content really helped people and, and, and what didn't um, is that um, basically in this moment, especially your audience is not, they can be your storytellers. I think, you know, that's already been said, um, but having your audience be your storytellers is a great symbiotic relationship, not just because, um, you know, you want someone to tell your story and to like, to help you get your mission out there and to help you share whatever um, textbook or product you have available for other people. But it's also really important because that is a part of your community that you can kind of fuel and you can help give them a starting point to tell their own stories um, as it relates to your your work that you're doing. Um, so things that we've seen being especially popular right now are really simple uh, tweets that just like they say the thing, they're bold and they just say the thing that people are already thinking. Um, so I, I'm looking at our Twitter analytics uh, right now. And one of our most popular tweets that had um, over 6,000 impressions and over 30 uh, retweets, that was just something that I just like, I noticed this was a trend on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, and so I tweeted, textbook should be free. That's it. That's the tweet. Like, <laughs> that's a really simple thing. It's not complicated. It's not, um, you know, it's not like a huge grand idea, but it's something that resonated with people and it got a lot of engagement and a lot of people were retweeting it and saying like, yeah, I switched to a free textbook in this course um, or, you know, students, a couple of students retweeted it saying like, I love it when my instructors use free textbooks, every textbook should be free. Um, and I think that about a year ago, that's something that we wouldn't really have shared. Uh, that's something that maybe would have felt too bold for us in that, in that moment, but we're constantly testing and trying and evolving and, and seeing what actually resonates with people. Um, I think that's pretty much all I have to share. I'll also say that it's really important um, to monitor um, conversations that are happening out there to, to like try to keep an eye on different trends, whether that's conversations around a specific topic, which if you're using Twitter, um, TweetDeck can help you do that. It's really great. Um, I think Sarah already mentioned using TweetDeck or somebody did, I hope it was Sarah. Um, but yeah, monitor the conversations that are happening, monitor conversations that seem like they might not be directly related to um, what you're wanting to get out in the moment, but conversations that could play a big role in you know helping you advance your goals. Thank you, Symphony. And thank you, Sarah, Carolina, and Lee. What a great overview of um, storytelling and community engagement and marketing. I uh, really appreciate how each of you brought uh, sort of a different piece of this puzzle to the conversation. So now is the time for community questions. Feel free to unmute if you prefer or to drop them in chat. 
Okay, we have our first one. Question for BC campus specifically, but would love to hear from others too. Curious about the level of effort in terms of time and human resources it takes for the development of each newsletter. Great question. Oh. Yeah, great question. So uh, this the newsletter is something I work on with my colleague Kat, and she would know for sure the hours, but um, hmm, that's a good question. I'd say a couple of hours every week between sourcing the images that we use because we do try to have a very diverse and inclusive um, amount of images that we also use image description for just to make sure that our audience um, is inclusive to everyone. There's a lot of copy editing involved. And then um, obviously we got to source all the content from our calendar, our editorial, our community at large. So I would say at least a few hours a week, but I'm not 100% sure because I, I, I tap in towards the end as the final eye and um, my wonderful colleague Kat does a lot, of the, a lot of the work. And what frequency do you send out a newsletter? So we send it out now weekly, um, but before I joined the team, it was like once a month. So uh, BC Campus has grown a lot in the last few years, um, and we used to take the summers off, but because uh, that's kind of like our quiet time in the post-secondary world. But even last summer, we were pushing things out every week, which is just so unheard of for us. So um, there's been like really great growth and really great need and want. Oh, thanks everyone. <laughs> we uh, really great growth and want for our newsletter. So we're really thrilled with, with how much it's grown in the last couple of years. I would add to that too, that with newsletters, and I think the BC campus does this, but I know Rebus does it too, um, that it, it is really helpful to start with a template. Like if you're gonna, like if, if you're using MailChimp, go in and spend the time to make like a really solid template where you can just plug and play your information later. And it really makes, like it, it's a lot of upfront work, but it it uh, carries out and makes everything much easier later on. And on the topic of newsletters, I didn't have, I didn't want to put this in my, my five minutes because it just didn't feel like it was the right place to say it. But I think it's so important that if you, have a need or a want to create a newsletter to do it just because uh, newsletters holds you have so much information in the power of your hands uh, with the listserv that you don't necessarily get to keep if it's the same content on social media because we don't own our Facebook pages Facebook does right like we don't own our Twitter so if there's anything to ever happen to our social media channels it's so nice to have that backup um, to be able to communicate uh, just because you have full ownership of your listserv there. So I definitely encourage that if you have the capacity and means to have a newsletter, even if you're posting something out once a month or once a quarter, like definitely focus on growing and building that. Thanks, Catalina. Um, I know there's a question in the chat from Amy and Amy asks, do I have permission now to stop posting on Facebook? And from the sounds of it, Twitter seems like the place for um, all of the open education work. But Symphony, I might ask you, because you mentioned how OpenStax has a presence in so many different platforms. Do you find yourself leveraging something like Facebook for specific kinds of strategic activities? And do you turn to Twitter and LinkedIn and the other channels for, for other kinds? Um, so Facebook actually, so we actually have both organic and paid social. Um, so, so we do both. So we keep our Facebook organic social, which is for anyone who's, who's new to like these terms, I don't know. Um, basically organic social is just the stuff you post, you know, that I can even post on my own personal Twitter account, my own personal Instagram account, um, Paid social is is like advertising. It's like social media advertising. Um, so we keep our Facebook organic social active, um, but we don't get a ton of engagement on it. And it's it's interesting because our audience on Facebook is is like more than double the size of our audience on Twitter. Um, but it's just not you know, they get, it's, there's not a lot there. So we do keep it going just because there's a lot of people there. And like, just in case people are coming across things, we don't want them to maybe miss out on um, an event that we're having or um, anything like that. But it's not like our main driving force. I would say, and I'd, I'd love to hear others weigh in on this, but I would say if you're not getting a lot of use out of Facebook, maybe just consider how you can kind of 
keep it alive for those people who might come across posts on Facebook, but don't make it like, you know, a huge time suck for you where it's causing a lot of unnecessary work. That's really helpful. And I know Karen is mentioning how they've recently decommissioned their Facebook um, at the Open Education Network. And on the Rebus end, we're doing something like you suggest, Symphony, which is um, having it open, having it active, but not too active, where most of our um, communications takes place via newsletter or Twitter. Um, I know there was another question in the chat um, from Kristen. And Kristen asks, does anyone have advice um, or outcomes from posting as the open education unit at your institution versus as the library? And said, I'm guessing given your um, interactions and connections with many departments within the institution, you might have uh, a lot to say about that. Yeah, um, I think it's been very helpful for us to just kind of utilize every one we can. Um, I know, we have had um, like Virginia Tech overall has like retweeted or maybe like referenced some of the stuff we're doing, but it's nice to have um, just kind of like the library, like pushing everything out and being very cohesive. And we also have um, like, I'm trying to figure out how to explain this last slide. Um, I kind of like our publishing, our OER and um, the people who help us with communications are all separate teams, but they're all within the library. So I think it's, it is helpful to have the library as like a cohesive front on some of our social stuff. I don't know how helpful that is, but that's, a, that's what I, uh, I think it's best to just utilize as much as you can. And we get a lot of help from like our communications people within the library. And Carolina at BC campus as well, I mean, are, are you getting uh, input and news from other institutions in the province? How are you sort of sourcing all of that content from um, all of the uh, communities you support? Yeah, uh, so we have, I forget how many, but we have, I think about 20 or so post-secondary institutions in BC, please don't quote me on that. And um, it's really great to folk, like to work on building relationships with them. Um, we definitely found that the best thing to do to help amplify whatever message we're pushing out is to connect with them directly via email or, or if we get to know them via a DM on whatever channel, um, what social media channel it is. But we found that if we put in that extra few minutes of you know work to type up that email or type up that DM being like, hey, we just shared this announcement about your school, um, the engagement rates just shoot straight up and the impact of them lasts for so much longer than just the day that the post went out. Yeah, that's really helpful. And that sort of ties back to what Lee was suggesting mm -hmm. about how just that direct message and sort of that ping and reminder can have such a big impact and is definitely not not wrong. It It's definitely something you should be doing. No, we're all like doing our best to have the same goal, like the institutions or whoever you're partnering with obviously wants to bolster the, the people under their umbrella. And we obviously want to have people come to our blog or retweet our thing. So it's like, I think it was uh, Symphony who said, it's all about that symbiotic relationship of, of working together with all the partners that you're with. Definitely. Well, I'm just looking, scanning through the chat for more questions and, um, looks like folks are wondering if you could share examples of messaging that worked well and messaging that didn't work so well. It sounds like all of you are trying and experimenting um, different ways of communicating. So if you have examples at your fingertips, we'd love to hear them. And anyone can jump in, <laughs> feel free to. I'll go first. Um, so our most popular post I think of the year so far so just for 2021 was a very simple, uh, almost like PowerPoint type graphic that explained what open ed education, open educational resources are. Um, it was shared widely with student groups on our Twitter or on our Instagram. I mean, um, people ate it up all over LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, like it, and it was so simple and it just took it back to basics because it was a really easy way for people to be like, this is what I'm working for. This is what my goal is. Or it's, it was an easy way for students to be like, this is what we need to advocate for in our, in our universities. So um, things that keep it simple and shareable and easy are, are definitely what I would recommend um, if you're looking for uh, messaging that works for you. 
I also think it's important to think about who you're trying um, to kind of target with your messaging. I know um, kind of going off of like maybe like memes and stuff on Twitter might resonate with like younger people and students, but if you're trying to uh, communicate to like faculty, um, you might want to have more of like a professional kind of presence. But I mean, there's pros and cons to both. And I think there's a lot to be said for communicating in both ways if you can. Sarah, your, your comment about um, reaching faculty connects to something Kristen said in the chat about LinkedIn. I was wondering if any of you could speak to your strategies or thoughts on LinkedIn. And Symphony, you also mentioned YouTube in passing. So perhaps we could talk about those two spaces and sort of the unique strategies or challenges um, that, that people could think about there. Yeah, so we are, um, we have YouTube and LinkedIn. Um, our YouTube is actually like really long standing. Um, we have some super old content on our YouTube account that is, it's, um, it's like a collection of videos that were meant to accompany our books um, at one point, but we also have other um, more marketing centric ma material on our YouTube as well. Um, I wanna address the question on LinkedIn. So on LinkedIn for us, um, LinkedIn is really important for, yes, um, connecting with faculty, but it's also important for putting material out there um, that faculty can then kind of like repost um, in hopes that the higher ups on their campus might see it. Um, so it is a, it's a professional platform. So it's something that um, faculty are on. A lot of faculty, of course, are, are also on Twitter, um, but faculty are on, but also, you know, provosts are, are often on LinkedIn. Um, and so having that option there, um, we tend to stick with like a highly professional level of content on our LinkedIn. Um, things that we think that, you know, faculty might be excited to share um, and hope that others in their department might see. So like new book announcements. Um, we also try to share things that faculty or higher ups on campus might be interested in, um, like new initiatives, new programs, um, those sorts of things. So the, the fun, bold stuff, um, like, you know, that's it, that's the tweet. We, we wouldn't do that <laughs> on, on LinkedIn. We'd be sharing more, you know, stuff that's that's professional in nature. Okay. I was just gonna ask if I could um, first thank you for your response, Symphony, but also to observe that um, I think that's one of the appeals for LinkedIn to me. Um, you mentioned having sort of more in-depth, serious content that faculty could engage with, but for other social media, um, such as Twitter or Instagram or even Facebook, I get the sense, or even emails out to faculty, I get the sense that we're supposed to keep it, you know, short and pithy and not overwhelming. Um, but in LinkedIn, I guess the reason I'm wondering about it is I already have a network there and it's more personal than like having the library presence for social media in my case that we would have in Facebook or emails coming from, you know, the library as an institution or the library as an office. Um, and I haven't done that in the past, but I, I'm kind of wondering how, how that could be different. One, it would be more personal, but two, it would be using my personal professional network to go more in depth, right? Um, to give people more to think about, more to read about that they would be expecting in that platform. So I appreciate your comments, but I just wanted to, to share that that was meaningful to me too. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is really interesting um, because I think it like there's like a personal comfort, you know, that you have to assess of like, do I wanna, you know, leverage and share this with my personal network to get this message out. So that's a, a really interesting question that I think a lot of us who are using social media for um, 
for these kinds of things have to navigate at some point. I don't know if, if any other other panelists or had anything to share. Okay. Um, I, I, I think it's interesting too, because Kristen, you're talking about, it sounds like your personal um, LinkedIn presence, whereas, you know, some of us have organizational presences, you know, you can have like the OEN LinkedIn page. And it's so, there is a lot to think about there. If, if you haven't sort of um, cross the line is the only metaphor I can think of, although it doesn't sound quite right, but if you haven't, you know, made that change before. Um, looking to the chat, uh, Anita is asking about ideas regarding timing. I think there's a sort of mythology, so I'm very interested also in what our guests have to say about like, is there a magic time, uh, day of the week or so on that makes um, a, a tweet more sticky or more effective? And um, same question with channels. And then kind of along the same line, um, I bet that some of us would love to know uh, which hashtags you use, which I know is a little reductive, but still is really helpful for um, those who are sort of new in this space and trying to experiment and try new things. So um, your ideas regarding timing, channels, and hashtags, please. I'll take, I'll take a stab. Timing you'll drive yourself crazy. Like, honestly, I don't, I, I tried so hard to figure that out. And there's just so many conflicting ideas. And then also time zones that like, I honestly would just not like tr try for the middle of the day, maybe, but like it'll, the way that the, the way that the feed works is it's not necessarily always the, the most recent tweet It's the most recently engaged with tweets that go to the top. And I think actually Sarah probably has interesting things to say about this too, since she's sort of studying this. Um, but like in in my in my experience, like it it matters a little, but you'll drive yourself nuts. So just as long as you like keep it going around it, it doesn't. Um, I don't think it matters that much. But that might be controversial. The other thing I'll say about hashtags is uh, I use OER, I use open publishing, I use open education, um, but it's different depending on the context. Like it really just depends on what you're, what you're trying to do there. And one note about hashtags is um, it's an accessibility thing. Please uh, capitalize the first letter of your, if you're using a multi-word hashtag to capitalize the first letter of every word because it makes it easier to read. Um, Yes, yeah, so I agree with um, everything you just said. Um, I think it's important to not sh like stress about about the timing as much. I know we kind of aim to do like the middle of the day or like maybe like right after like the working hours because that's when people are like more on social media. But I mean, I don't think that's the most meaningful uh, thing to focus on. We also talk about in my program like numbers versus like actual engagement so if you if you create something that people are, are that's resonating with them that they're engaging with and that's like impactful that's much more important than how many people are seeing something or how many people are, are liking something um so that's just like something to keep in mind i oh go ahead no you go for it symphony Oh, I was just going to say that I think the, the timing question um, is really, I agree that timing doesn't matter and that you can drive yourself mad trying to figure out what time to do stuff. I think it, it goes back to like old, um, like email best practices of like not sending out emails at certain times of the day or too close to the weekend. So like even at OpenStax, we used to have a rule of like, none of our marketing emails or email newsletters could go out on Fridays um, because no one was gonna look at them. Well, now everyone has their email <laughs> on their phone and their phone is with them all the time. So, you know, you, people are probably gonna see an email if it goes out on Friday. Um, and I think for social media, it goes back to a time when, like Lee was saying, the feed was just showing you the most recent post, no matter what kind of engagement it got. So definitely, don't don't go crazy trying to figure out the right time and like 
you know, you can schedule stuff. You can, you can even test if you want to, if you're scheduling stuff through TweetDeck, you can like try to test out different times um, and see if, if there's something that works, but don't give it too much energy. Yeah, I agree with everything that was said. I would spend more energy in crafting your content, crafting uh, your community, things like that. Um, it's, it has a better return on investment than thinking about time and yeah. <laughs> And who knows, maybe there's an untapped uh, open education night owl community out there. <laughs> um, so before we move on to what may be kind of our last uh, question and discussion point, I would just like to mention, because it's so on topic, that uh, the OEN is looking for a digital content strategist. So if you have colleagues or others who are um, working in this space, uh, please share this invitation broadly. We are still receiving applications and hope to start interviewing next month. And the goal of that position is to do very much what our guests have talked about today, and that is tell the stories of what our members are doing um, in open education and to share those resources broadly. So um, we're really excited about bringing someone new onto our team. So looking at what I think are kind of the, the last couple questions uh, within a particular theme, and that is um, Ksenia and then Jonathan and Amy, you know, what does, and, and I'm hoping that each of our four guests can speak to this. Why are, why are you doing this? Um, it may be easier to, to answer like according to an organization, but also thinking at the book level or at the personal level, why engage on social media and uh, what does success look like? So um, I think that's a nice way to, to round out our conversation today. So I'll hand it over to the four of you. So I think specifically, and Anita, thank you for answering this a little bit in the chat. Um, with our Biosystems book, one of the reasons we wanted to create like a social campaign around it was um, we have a huge international team of authors. We had a ton of different people working on it and kind of getting it out to, you know, maybe their countries of origin and having the opportunity for them to share their work and make this like a really widespread textbook, which I think, you know, the goal of this is ultimately so students can have uh, inexpensive free resources for, in, um, for textbooks. So kind of just making sure people are aware of it, they can adapt it, they can use it, um, students can have access to it, even if they're not, you know, especially they're not US based. I think that's kind of our goal on that. Yeah, I would, I would add to that with like, we're talking about um, at the book level. So I work for organizations that aren't knowledge producing organizations in the same way that my, my, my co-panelists are, but like the idea behind sharing book information for me has always just been like the reason, like why it's open is that you want the most amount of people to be able to use the book. And so it drives adoptions. And I will say, we're talking a lot about like metrics, specifically like engagement metrics and click throughs and impressions and all of these things. But like, there's sort of um, like in, in marketing, we call it the top of the funnel where you're just trying to create like a qualitative buzz around open or your book specifically that isn't necessarily always captured as easily as like a one-to-one -one, like engagement equals adoption. Like it's, it doesn't, it's not as easy a through line as that, but engagement might equal like more people interested in open, which is a little bit of a harder thing to nail down. But like, uh, I, I would say very important because a greater conversation around open, a greater conversation around open textbooks benefits everybody who participate in that conversation. And as well as people who don't even know about open yet. So a student might see this, this bio book that we've been talking about, and they may not be taking a bio, but they might ask themselves like, hey, I would love for my book to be free. And that is a good outcome too. So yeah. That's 100%. Uh, it, um, it's those vanity metrics that are nice that you can kind of tick off as like key performance indicators that you got the retweet, you got the like, um, but it's really, if it's so much harder to measure this, uh, what happens when that is shared, when people start having a conversation, how it starts with your tweet, but trickles in to other conversations elsewhere. So um, I would definitely 
have metrics so that you have something to fall back on, but also give yourself some grace in knowing that some of the stuff that is successful is just, it it can be immeasurable. Um, And so you have to just trust the process. So I'll try to answer both questions. So I I see that um, it was mentioned that like for the OpenStax brand identity, like that, that is important. So I did it there's probably two primary reasons why we have this this type of work around social media. And one is of course, yeah, our brand identity is really important. Um, When we started publishing textbooks in 2012, we were like, nobody knew who we were. (laughs) Um, And that top of funnel, like just getting people to be aware that OpenStax is a thing, um, like social media was important for that. I think the other really big reason why we have social media for for OpenStax is that um, it's really part of our mission and how we see the work that we're doing. So open education is a movement and it's a part, like it's a massive community of people um, who are empowered by this idea of democratizing knowledge. And in a lot of ways, social media gives an opportunity to democratize um, storytelling and to democratize different, you know, experiences that we don't normally get to see um, out in other traditional media. So um, having, you know, a space to be active on social media and be a part of those conversations is really important for OpenStax. Um, And I will will agree with what's been said in terms of metrics, like um, definitely take the wins where you can find them. So, you know, it might not be that you had X number of people retweet a post um, or that you had X number of people like something, um, but just that, you know, a couple of people were like really excited about something that you shared um, is still really huge. And if you have to think about numbers, I would say think about them in relation to your audience size um, so I think earlier I said something like we had a tweet that had like 6,000 impressions and impressions is basically like who's seeing that tweet. Um, that's great for us, but we have, you know, like over 9,000 followers on our Twitter account and um, like our followers have followers and and they have followers. So that's great. But if you don't have that many followers, then you shouldn't be like get hung up on, you know, well, my, my tweet didn't have 6,000 impressions. Like think of things, if you have to think of numbers, think of them in relation to your audience size. Thank you so much, Symphony, and all of the other speakers. I think what I'm getting from our conversation today is to constantly be reflecting about what you do and the value that you can provide. I think, Symphony, you said this earlier, um, and I'm taking away that there is so much work that goes into what what looks on the outside like a very simple marketing strategy with um, a number of tweets and a number of other areas um, to engage, but it sounds, and hearing from all of you, it sounds like there is so much more thought and intention behind all of those actions. So I really appreciate having the chance today to see it all laid out so clearly. And I hope everyone um, who's on the call today can thank um, all of our guests for sharing their um, thoughts, sharing their reflections today. Karen, I might turn it over to you um, to wrap us up for the day. Thanks, Aperva. I just want to note that our April session will continue in this same vein, storytelling with anecdotal evidence and data, not necessarily on social, but just thinking about um, different types of stories, different ways to communicate uh, success, however it may be defined with your different stakeholders. Um, And to echo Aperva, Please um, join us in thanking Sarah, Carolina, Lee, and Symphony, and all of you for coming to join us today with your questions. We look forward to seeing you again next month. Farewell.